everybody happy new year good wishes for 2022 and we'll come back to the expire show where we feature the amazing people in tech and science innovation and entrepreneurship and for 2022 we have curated a whole series of, of, of a, uh, innovators, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs that you'll that find, find very, very exciting. And this series is brought to you by Science Center Singapore, the Singapore Institute of Technology, and Neo Aeronautics. All right, so for January 2022, we have four very interesting speakers that, and they're all young. And, uh, some of them have been working with them for a couple of months in the last uh, last year, actually in 2021. And um, when we first started, we are looking at the sciences and say, where are the customer? Where really are the innovations? So what do we do? We use the things that you learned before, right? Apply your design thinking, do your lean methodology, do customer discovery, validation. And for today, very interesting that for a project and a piece of technology that's falling from the sky and was wondering what can we use it for? And after six months, we come up with a new concept called the digital forest. Isn't it exciting? So let's go and look and visit the person who came up with the idea of the digital forest. Join me. And hi, this is Dr. Shen Chi. Hello. And a PhD from the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And obviously, the co founder and CEO of ACID. Now, I mentioned about digital forest, it's going to walk you through the forest. All right, Shane, fast to you. Thank you, Prof. Neil, uh, for the great introduction. Uh, Happy New Year to you, and thank you for having me here. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone watching also. Uh, yeah, so I am Shane. I am currently a research fellow at uh, Area Innovation Research Lab at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Um, wait, change. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Right. So, um, so I have been working on this um, aerial deployment technology. Uh, for my PhD. So it started back in 2016. Uh, so let me just, okay, so yep, this is basically me and, right, so I got my PhD um, in 2020. And basically I like uh, to design and build uh, robotics projects. And uh, this started like way back when I was in when I was a kid, and then I started building things like boats, uh, radio control boats, and do things like that. And when I joined SUTD in 2012 uh, to do my bachelor degree, and I joined this uh, undergraduate research program uh, under Prof. Xiaohui. And that is when I got, to, uh, got my first time building uh, drones. So I actually started to build and then learn how to build, uh, learn how to fly drones back in 20. 12, and then uh, when I finished my bachelor in 2015, I joined Hope Technic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I actually spent the time to build uh, drones that they used for aerial display and mm -hmm. NDP uh, uh, SG50 uh, in yeah. Yeah, 2015. That show. Uh, so uh, that I decided to uh, go back into research because I found that uh, research uh, and doing a lot of like interesting things and um, you know uh, just like doing new things and publishing research results I, I found that like a bit interesting so I joined back and under Prof Shalve I, I did like research um, so I spent four years doing my PhD and basically my uh, area of expertise was in design control and optimization of uh, what we call semi auto rotating wings, which is uh, this uh, prototype right here. And also design control and optimization of a single actuator monocopter, which is uh, hidden inside here. Uh, I'll take it out and show later on. 
So I'm um, currently I'm a research fellow uh, at Aerial Innovation Research Lab in SUTD. Uh, so, and these are some of the pictures of like uh, prototypes that I worked with uh, throughout this time. So um, how did we come about like this auto-rotating wing idea? Uh, it's, it's basically from, uh, it's a maple seed. Like if you have seen a maple seed before uh, in nature, uh, maple seeds drop uh, uh, from the trees when yes, they stand in this grass. And when, when, when they drop, they actually do this very graceful maneuver uh, motion called uh, auto-rotation. And when it does auto-rotation, what it does is it slows down the descent speed. So instead of just free falling uh, to the ground, it slows down, rotates, and wind blows and it will disperse. So yeah. the function of it is to disperse. And there are people who are inspired by this, uh, this concept. Uh, so this is what we call the biomimicry, right? Yeah, bi yeah. biomimicry. Yeah. And, and when they copy it, and they want to actually, Back in 1900, like 1906 or something, people actually tried to build helicopters mm. out of this shape. Okay. So you can imagine there's a person sitting in the seat area of it, like around here, somebody sitting there, and the whole giant wing rotating. So obviously it didn't work because it's too complex and you need to keep the person stable that can't be spinning around. Right. So it didn't really work. But the concept like took off uh, as unmanned aerial vehicle okay. back in 2000s, like 2007, 2008. That's when like uh, MIT uh, Lockheed Martin came into the uh, this space and then they started to build something called monocopters. Monocopters basically uh, this maple seat that can fly by itself. I think it's very difficult to describe. Do you have pictures to show us? Uh, <laughs> um, maybe I can just show you the this craft here. Mm -hmm. I didn't like put it in the picture there. Right, so this one is actually quite special uh, because it is like folded into a like hand yeah, okay. size craft. Mm. So if I unfold it right, it becomes a full size monocopter. So just by unfolding it, ah. so then uh, so there's like yeah, boom, boom, boom. I can just straight that just throw right. Yeah. Just, basically, you can hand launch it. You yeah, hand launch yeah. it, and then it's flying. Actually, very stable like this. This maple seat is uh, aerodynamically. So can, can I have say a look yeah. at it? So, so yeah, so that's the batteries, that's the wings, right? Yeah. And then you have the uh, the propellers. Yes. So how does it fly? It fly this way? No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's very counterintuitive. Uh, so, and one of the things about this is that it is one single actuator. Mm. So normally when like things are flying, they need like, Four actuators or more like conventional quadcopters, yes, yes, four yes, actuators yes. Uh, at the very least. So this one uses just one actuator. And so it flies like this. So mm. this way, the propeller is I producing see. thrust okay, okay. Uh, this way, and it rotates around the center of gravity, yes. which is somewhere around the, the base of the wing here. Mm -hmm. It rotates. And the whole wing generates lift. Mm -hmm. And based on that lift, it takes off. And then uh, to control it, we uh, we do a very precise timing pulsing of the motor. So when you pulse in the correct uh, sequence, then you can start moving around uh, in X, Y directions. So, oh, so you actually can control it. Yes. You so it's a like flying wing. Yes, it is really right. a, a very simple helicopter. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you can fly left, right, up, down, uh, all this. Can okay, you can as a guy, you can build your own helicopters, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is one of the, the very interesting things. So you have any videos to show us? I have videos, uh, but it's on YouTube. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Is that the only single slide, slides you have or what else you, you can have? Oh, we yes. have like more slides behind. Okay, go, let's yeah. go ahead then. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and the other thing that we were working on is the auto-rotating version. So uh, monocopters inherently they can auto rotate when they when you switch off the power uh, it will auto rotate like a mm -hmm. maple seed, mm -hmm. but they are not really that optimized uh, because of the weight distribution and all that. So uh, back in my PhD when I first started, uh, my prof was like, okay, why don't we focus on like you know this auto rotating part of it? We mimic the full maple seed and then we try to control it. And apparently there are people who tried that before, but uh, it is quite difficult to mm. achieve control uh, around that time. So I was like the first one to actually 
manage to make it move in a direction that I want. And it's a PhD. Yes. It's true. You got a PhD. Yeah. That's good. Good job. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Let's bro. go ahead. All right. So we uh, thought of like uh, ideas, like what can we actually use this technology for to solve real world problems? And, and that's when we joined the Lean Launchpad program by Propnio. And we started to brainstorm for ideas, like what can we do? Um, but there are a lot of things that we came up with at first, like reforestation, uh, a lot of like pressing issues about like climate change and all that, like it depends on like trees absorbing carbon dioxide. And now there's a lot of like deforestation, uh, people are chopping down the trees and all that. So we thought of like reforestation, but uh, we came up with a better idea, like in the middle of the program. And that is uh, what we call digital forest. Well, I'm actually very, very proud of this work. And then proud of them, the first thing is, please trademark this <laughs> digital forest. It's yes. fascinating, right? How you digitize a forest. So if anyone has any question, please post your questions on the chat and we'll answer it later. Carry on. Yes, please do. Um, so, um, so, we, with a, so I have like a few colleagues uh, who are also doing the same uh, research in the same, same lab. And we also worked together for the past, I don't know how many years, um, more than five years. And we came up with this idea to do digital forest. So we call ourselves AirSeed um, because it's something to do with air and then it is, we are inspired from seeds. So, and just to make it a bit cooler, we just, uh, have the F. Why, 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 yeah, the X, right? C is S, then you put an X. Um, it's grammatically wrong. Grammatically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was, so the thing is, there was a company uh, in Australia yeah. doing reforestation. Yeah. And their name is S Seed yeah. with S. Yeah. So we just wanted to be we, we, yeah. Yeah, a bit more on technology side. So, yeah, yeah. Which <laughs> you have the X factor. Yeah, we have <laughs> Okay. So um, this is the team. So I have, I'm part of the team and uh, there's Luke. Uh, Luke is the research. He's like focusing on the research part of the pro problem. And there's Daniel, uh, who recently graduated as a PhD uh, and he's taking charge of the software. And there's Ing Hong, uh, he is an expert in like making uh, product focused design. And we have advisors, Professor Xiao Hui Fong uh, from uh, FCTD. And also uh, recently we had a business mentor, Mr. Ken Fang Fu. And our research work uh, basically is like quite, uh, is featured all across like uh, different websites uh, like IEEE Spectrum, Popular Science. And we have received a SG Mark uh, Design Award for our design work here. And yeah, you can see like the, some snapshots of like websites that are featuring our work. And so basically, okay, let me introduce like why uh, we want to do digital forests. Right, that's right, there's then no more research. We go into innovation. Yes. What problem are you solving? Yes. Yeah. So every year, uh, the, but we are actually very lucky to be in Singapore because we don't have to worry about this thing called wildfires. And wildfires, is a problem that haunts many homes in the US and Australia and also Europe, basically all the, the developed countries or around there. And just uh, in the US alone, the annual cost and losses to wildfires can be 71 to $350 billion. So that's a lot of money and a lot of like, actually a lot of homes are destroyed, all the costs that you can't really measure, a lot of lives, uh, yeah. a lot of like ecosystem, plant, animal ecosystem, all these destroyed. So as an example, uh, there was back in 2018, there was a fire called Camp Fire. And the fire was in California uh, and it grew like so big. The size of the fire was 621 kilometers squares. And as a comparison, I put Singapore map there, and Singapore is just slightly bigger than the size of the entire fire in that. Uh, Before the reclaimed land is the Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at, at the fire's peak, uh, it just took like four hours to reduce like 11,000 homes and like businesses, and it took away 85 uh, lives uh, of people. And the cost of that fire, alone was $16 billion. So uh, 
if you think about the insured covered losses, like it's about $12.5 billion and other like costs combined to become $16 billion. It is a scary sight to behold. Like, so I looked it up on Google Maps, uh, the place uh, uh, today, and we found that like many of the homes are still not rebuilt. There's a lot of like stories of like insurance uh, nightmares, uh, people trying to claim insurance, insurance companies going bankrupt because of all the, the losses. So that's a big problem. Yeah. And um, so when it comes to wildfires, uh, the key thing is basically prevention. Like uh, when you detect the fire, you prevent it from making it uh, spread and become bigger. So um, it is really time, it's really the essence to. It's like heart attack. Yeah. The first few seconds were yeah. important, right? Yes, yeah? exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like, if you can't detect it, it becomes out of control, it right. becomes too big to control. So within the first 60 minutes, uh, the fire is basically smoldering, like all the smoke coming out and growing. And in the first one or three hours, it becomes an open fire and where it starts to spread really rapidly. And if you can't control it for days, it just becomes a giant like fires that are spreading uh, thousands of uh, like, a few football fields every second. So, wow, yeah, yeah. football fields every yeah. second. Yeah. It's almost like throwing throw, throw a, like, a, a bomb there and just hoping <laughs> will happen, right? Yeah. Uh, I think like they calculate it based on a parameter. So uh -huh. like it's probably so a thin line like, spreading out. Mm. So if you calculate the whole area of it, it's like football fields every second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not like as, yeah, it's, just <laughs> like, it's not like one football field like, in front of you. Yeah, and, right. like, so it's just expanding. Yeah, it's expanding. Uh, so the, based on research, the wildfire is actually handled very efficiently in the first 30 minutes. So um, there are existing methods to detect the wildfire. And these include like uh, placing, manually placing like sensors in the forest and putting heat cameras in the forest where they think there'll be fire. So these cameras are like fixed there and then they just like rotate around and then scan for a fire. There are watchtowers where people manually uh, man the tower to watch for the fire. There's a satellite observations uh, where satellites overhead, they pass over the area, they look at the area, see whether they got like, any fire or not. Um, so the thing is, um, the detection time is actually quite critical here. And basically having the actual sensor on the place itself is basically the fastest way to catch the fire mm -hmm. when it happens. Yeah. So you can detect the fire in the first 15 minutes, then you send the, the necessary resources to contain the fire and it will prevent it from spreading around and becoming a big wildfire. So that's when we thought of like, there's opportunity to actually go into this. So because you put the sensor in the forest, but um, if you are manually doing it, um, you're gonna take a lot of time and a lot of like, effort of workers going to the forest, climb the trees and fix the sensor there. It's going to be dangerous, tedious, and also uh, costly. So we thought of like using our technologies that we developed to deploy the sensors and do, to do that. So our MVP is basically um, this forest monitoring systems, which we call forms. And basically it is, um, our auto rotating wing integrated with a gas humidity and temperature sensor to detect the fire when it uh, happens. And we have a controllable flat to sort of like control when, when we drop the thing, then we'll drop like several sensors together and then they will spread out to the, necess the, the desired locations, land on the treetops. Yeah. And they will be, they will be equipped with uh, long range communication devices uh, so that they can talk to each other among themselves in places where there's no radio communication, uh, like, like 4G, for mm -hmm. example. If you don't have 4G, then they have to talk to each other, form a local network. And then uh, the gateway devices that are near the, the civilization areas, then they will upload the data uh, into the cloud. That's very intelligent, right? So you drop, you, you, you drop these type of devices where they have a, what you call a mesh network, right? Yes. They talk among themselves, yeah. collect on the data, and then eventually you go to the edge. Yeah. You say, oh, then I transfer yeah. to yes. the, the base station. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Okay. That's so, good. And where does the power come from? The power comes from solar panels. So okay. these, these devices are going to be like very low power. 
So they just need like to the sun to recharge them every day. Uh, and especially when during the times when it is very fire prone, uh, like the hotter periods, then you have plenty of sun to like yeah, recharge. Yeah. And during the winter time, if there's like not much sun, it doesn't really uh, matter if you are not fully yeah. charged or not. Like, I mean, you can work on a hibernation uh, mode, for example. I see. So, and the thing is, we will deploy these uh, devices on treetops. So, this is one of the key things because tree having been uh, deployed on a treetop means two things. The first thing is that uh, you will receive maximum sunlight to right. recharge for yourself. And the other thing is for longest communication range. So by having line of sight on top of the tree, then you have a better network coverage in okay. a sense, yeah. So the device is landed on a tree and if there's a fire, the smoke and gases will be picked up by the sensor on the device and it will be transferred back to, to the cloud and then you can receive it, uh, the detection alert on your phone uh, so the fire department can deploy the necessary resources almost in real time. So that's the architecture of it. So we will deploy uh, gateway devices and sensors uh, across the remote parts of the forest and they can pick up like actually digital forest means that like you can do a lot more than just detecting wildfires. Mm. If you integrate like uh, other types of sensors like carbon levels or like humidity, temperature, uh, all these things, uh, I mean, what I can think of is like can be useful for like monitoring the health of the forest. And it can even be used for things like uh, if there are people lost in the forest and they don't have network coverage, you can actually like in the future, if you can tap on the network of these devices, then you can send your SOS signal uh, uh, or like get communication. Okay, yeah. good. Right. So the now uh, maybe I just tell a bit more about like what this uh, auto rotating wing is capable of. So it's actually the 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 deployment method and the design of this is actually patented. And what it does is when you drop it, it will auto rotate gracefully like the maple seed. And then uh, when the flap uh, is actuated to a certain angle then what it does is it dives. Uh, it doesn't auto-rotate anymore. It dives like an arrow, like towards the ground. So it goes down at very fast speeds, like um, 30, 40 meters per second. So we found this useful because like um, when you're dropping, maybe there's a bit too much wind that you cannot overcome. Then you can dive to pass through the windy condition. And once it is like, back to normal and then you can like mm -hmm. go back into auto rotation and then you can control where you want to drop. And these are, these devices are supposed to be deployed by aircraft or UAVs. So, and, and they're actually very robust. You can drop it in any way you want and you can be ensured that they will auto rotate. It won't feel like a parachute, uh, parachute where like your uh, canopy doesn't like inflate, then mm -hmm. there's a risk of like the thing just falling down. Mm -hmm. And lastly, these can be, these are actually for precision aerial deployment. So you can actually precisely control where you want to land. Yeah. So if uh, the forest monitoring system was deployed back in 2018, um, so we just did some calculations, rough calculations. Uh, we just need like 6,200 sensors to cover the whole area. It will cost only about like, 2.5 million and we can detect the fire in the first 15 minutes. Then you will save like $16 billion of like cost that the fire will eventually destroy. And we will also save the lives of like 85 people. Yeah. Yeah, we, we stay on this slide first, right? Yeah, because sure. this is the, where the entrepreneurship comes in, right? Yeah. Now you have innovation to solve the problem. So the entrepreneurship part is what do you really, how do you run it as a business? Yes. And yeah, and, and obviously, uh, if we look at the uh, customer problems, $16 billion, and of course, this is uncountable, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So you look at a $16 billion of losses, including uh, insurance. The, those are insurance payouts for yeah. houses, yes. the farm, and yeah, whatever, businesses. right? Yeah. And if you deploy that sensor, it costs you $2.5 million, and the insurance companies have to pay so much. The vast difference, right? 
So the question is, how long can that 2.5 million last? last? How many times you have to do it? Let's say in 10 years. Actually, that depends on how you, how well you design the sensor right. to be uh, weather resistant mm. and how well the solar panels and all that can function over the years. So uh, actually, this is not a new problem. Uh, people have like built things to last, like for example, animal trackers, like mm. they, they put like usual sensors on the animals, like birds, and then these are like solar powered and ah. they can last for like several years. Have you seen like this one where like, uh, they track an eagle or something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They fly yeah. here and there. Then, right. like at the end of the, like, when the bird died, they pick up a sensor and then like they can trace like, oh, this bird like, actually flew however uh, distance mm -hmm. and so what's the path that it took. Right. So all these sensors to last that long is actually something that is doable, mm -hmm. and we just need to make sure that we design in the proper way so that it will last. So well, even if you do do these things, right, sixteen billion over ten years. Right. Yeah. And just compute if I replace it every year. <laughs> it's still <laughs> yeah. Then this, yeah. Right. There's a business value proposition. Okay. So I mean, we're thinking of like uh, to make it last for ten to fifteen years. Mm. I mean, the batteries will have like charge cycles and mm. solar panels. After a while, maybe uh, there'll be dust on the solar panels, not efficient anymore. Mm. Then uh, we'll have to replace it. So we can actually detect which device is like not functioning anymore. Then we can like go and target to a target replacement of the right. device. Okay. Yeah. So carry on, carry on. It become more and more interesting. Actually, ah, yeah. So digital forest is our MVP, but we're also looking at like- what What's MVP? Our audience may not know what's MVP. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's the most valuable- Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it for you. <laughs> It's the minimum. Oh, yeah, minimum viable product. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go I say most viable product. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not confused with that. I'll, I'll say that's jewelry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, get yeah, viable product. Yeah. Um, so there are other things that we're looking at for um, to uh, use the technology in. And we found a few interesting I mean, things. Uh, obviously, one is defense related uses. I mean, that one is the elephant in the room. Like uh, these devices, of course, it will give you like advantage. Okay, let's not go into defense. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, let's go into something. Yeah, okay. Better. So uh, the other thing is also super interesting because um, currently like a lot of people may not know it. Like yeah. uh, weather stations around the world, they actually release uh, weather balloons uh -huh. every day. Uh, each weather station can send up to like two uh, to four balloons every single day. And when they release it, um, so the, the, each balloon is carrying like a small little sensor that is below attached on a string. And these balloons go up uh, carried by the wind and then they are measuring like humidity, wind speed and all that. Like and it goes all the way up to like 25 kilometers when there is like uh, very little atmospheric pressure yeah, yeah. Okay. and the balloon expands and then it pops. Yeah, yeah. And what happens after that is the sensor basically just drops. Yeah. Uh, so they have like a small thing like a drag shoot to slow down the descent of this sensor and it just drops somewhere and it's not recovered. Like this, this thing is like not a lot of people know it but it's happening. So we looked at Australia. In Australia, they have like about 60 weather stations or something like that. And then they release about two to four balloons every day. And in one year, that will become 20,000 balloons. Ah. 20,000 balloons and all these electronic devices that are just scattering into the environment yeah. and not recovered. I see. There's a reason why they're not recovering it currently because it's because of the price of the, the, the radio sound. So the manufacturers price it so that like, it's not worth it to recover. It's not worth it to like go yeah. out there, drive all the way, and then like find it in some field to recover. So it would cost a lot more to recover. Yes. So, and if you think about the environmental impact, uh, these devices uh, in one year is about 2,000 kilograms of like electronics, mm. just like polluting the environment yeah. and in the oceans. Mm. Uh, so what we thought of is like, if we put this, uh, ring on these devices and uh, when they're dropping, we can use our position like control landing 
mm -hmm. to bring the devices back to collection points. So when 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 you go back to collection point and then like people can pick it up and sort of like even reuse the the device. So from single use it becomes like multiple use, like maybe you can use it like 10 times. And the market for this is also quite big. Like, so each device is cost about 200 US dollars. Mm. So like in one year, just in Australia, that's uh, 4 million uh, US dollars. Mm. So and I talked to the weather experts in uh, Finland and they said like Germany also releases about 20,000 balloons every year. So there's 4 million here, 4 million here, like a lot of like the more developed countries, mm. they actually are spending quite a lot on this. Um, so if we can enter this market and then uh, make it uh, make all these radio phones more reusable, then we will make the environment, uh, we will make it more sustainable and we will save the environment. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay. Yep, and I think this is the last slide. Yeah, thank you. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you have questions for Shen, please uh, ask any questions that you want. But let, let's, let's talk about the journey, okay? Uh, I'm really interested is uh, that that uh, from a researcher to an innovator and a potentially an entrepreneur, right? Because you are transiting to that part, right? Of being an entrepreneur. So what's the difference between a researcher and innovator and an entrepreneur for you? Well, as a um, researcher, what you're most interested in is like something new that nobody really has done before you do uh, you try to push the boundaries of science in that particular field and then you uh, you make your research and then you publish it so that like, you expand the knowledge of the, the whole scientific community uh, that's really the goal of a researcher an innovator you basically find things to solve problems mm. you solve problems and you um, Try to do better and then like you know like you push the technology and then it's, I, I would say the innovator is like in between research and entrepreneur like like around the middle and entrepreneur is someone who's trying to uh, just find people's problems and solve it and then you, you try to make a business out of it yeah okay so so well so you're very clear definition the question is from a phd transiting from one to another what kind what do you have to change, right? From a researcher, what kind of mindset, skill sets, training, and do you feel scared? Yeah. Well, definitely yeah, a bit scared. <laughs> um, so the transition, like one of the things I learned like during the, the Ling Long Square program is actually finding um, uh, what people, what clients, what uh, what are the people consumers willing to pay money for right yeah like you might be actually trying to like you might have the best technology in something but it may actually not solve what they want like mm -hmm. it may not actually bring value in it so it's really important to do customer discovery and what people actually want and solving that so i think that's what i learned uh during the the program so it's, it's not not to worry right because as long as you attend my training no <laughs> I saw you attend a formal training uh, 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 and learn the technique, then you can transition, right? Yeah. But is there difficulties for you personally when you're doing a lab and now you start worrying about talking to people, interviewing <laughs> customers? Uh, how do you overcome? Well, uh, most researchers or like people who spend a lot of time in the lab, they won't be like um, uh, very comfortable with like you're talking to random people and then like finding out what they want mm. and that's one of the the, the more difficult things that i experienced yes. during the during the, the time so uh, we had to like cold call people we had to like uh talk to potential customers and find like uh what how to solve their problem without actually like you know imposing too much of your technology on them so that like you don't bias them and yeah, that's one of the things that uh, that was quite challenging as a researcher. Yeah. Okay, so so from researcher to the innovator, it's not too difficult because you are still dealing with a, a potential user. I wouldn't say customer, right? Because yeah. they might not be the 
person to pay, right? Yeah. So potential user, they have problems, they have the technology, and then you try to match. So being an innovator is just go out, find problem to solve, right? Yeah. But after you solve the problem, which you have, now is can you make money, right? <laughs> yes. So so that is another transition. So how do you prepare yourself for that into a potential entrepreneur? Well, like finding, I, I would say um, you would have to, for, for me in particular, right? We, we have to find, ours is not really a consumer type of like uh, technology. Like mm -hmm. It's not like something that people on the streets will buy or like use. So uh, the difficulty is in like for us is finding a business or like government institutions mm -hmm. or like, you know, weather stations and like, so we have to like prove ourselves like, oh, this is like what you actually need. This will solve like your problem. This will save, save you a lot of money. Or like, you know, for forest fires, you will detect a lot faster. And then, so uh, to talk to people like that, firstly, uh, what we find is that we need some sort of credibility. Like, yeah, we can actually do it. Like we have like 95% uh, confidence level of like you know, dropping these sensors and uh, they will detect the wildfire, you know? so. Uh, for us, the challenge is in like doing the proof of concept first, and then uh, at the same time, we need to find like people who are willing to pay money and then like be your customer. Uh, so the customer discovery part is slightly a bit tricky. Like mm -hmm. I mean, I would like that's my perspective. Like you know, to find government institutions uh, who are willing to pay money for this or insurance companies, talk to them. I think this is a uh, quite challenging for us. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the, thing, the thing is that you, from technology to solution to now you have to talk about business model and talk about how, you know, uh, how should I price it yeah. and what value I create for you and what is my cost so that I can make money? Should I sell you or should I provide service? So how, how do you handle all these things? <laughs> well, um... There is like, we, we thought of like um, a business model where yes. we will be like um, selling these devices and we will also deploy them. Like, like when the business is like small, then we will be like lean, lean enough to like uh, go and actually deploy these devices. And when we, when we sell these devices, then we will like put together like uh, a package where we will deploy them and then have a support for the next 10 or 15 years where like these devices will be working. And then we will, there's, there's, like, there's this back-end uh, software part where, you know, these devices have to talk to the cloud and then like mm. uh, there's a back-end server where you have to like alert and push to the apps. Sure. So uh, these are the other revenue stream. So first it's like selling and then deploying them. And then the next one is like, um, you know, providing a back-end support. And like if let's say the sensor, one of the sensors is down, then we need to like go and replace it. Yeah, that kind of thing. So what's the business model? Selling products or providing a services? It's kind of like both. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's like the, first you sell it and then you uh, like provide the backend service. Yeah. So it's kind of like comes together. Well, let's, let's ask you a very business issue, right? Uh, 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 I know I know your PhD is technology, but I think you're well-trained in business because you want to be an entrepreneur. How do you price your product? Well, um, it comes with like, I mean, there's a few different like approaches to it. Like firstly, the most engineering way is to like be the bomb, like BOM, and then uh, you list out all the materials that you'll be using and what are the, you calculate like what are the chances of like the equipment failing uh -huh. and then like replacement or like, uh, manufacturing costs, all that, like you factor in. And then after that, you can factor in a profit, uh, margin of profit. Like uh, after that, you can price it that way. Like there's one, that's one way. Mm -hmm. The other one, the, the, the other way is just to see like, what is the value that you're bringing to them? Like, are you mm -hmm. bringing safety? Like, you know, like uh, it will be peace of mind for us. Like, you know, uh, both for the uh, homeowners and insurance companies, like, if you can actually detect uh, the wildfire in the first 15 minutes and then your home is like not destroyed to the wildfire, um, that is like saving quite a lot of like money and then mm -hmm. value and then, uh, you know, habitats. So that's, that's the other thing is the value. So, um, and there's one more way is to like price it 
uh, according to competitors. But um, in our space, there is like not a lot of like companies doing like sensor deployment uh, or like uh, remote monitoring. So yeah, like we just find like sort of like a middle ground between all this and then make sure like, you know, we have like enough profit to like keep the business running. Yeah, so I think, it, it, I mean, uh, pricing obviously, first what we always do is like your bill of material, you do a bomb, yeah. which is a cost plus pricing, right? This is my cost. I want to make up this profit and that's the price, which is a, a not very, uh, what you call value driven, it's just cost driven. Yes. Yeah, of course, value driven is what, how much a customer I say, you pay so much, you might as well pay this yeah. and I save a lot more value and therefore you, 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 you're willing to pay the price. That's a value driven thing. Um, another way of doing this is really competitive pricing, right? The guy sell how much can I match? Yeah. Can I be better, slightly higher or whatever? Depends on the value you created. I think, okay, so one question uh, that's very important here is what, how do you actually uh, come up with a team, right? If you, you're going to spin off this company, what kind of team do you need? I, I would say like, um, like firstly, getting people that you can really work with, like mm -hmm. uh, a team that is synergetic mm -hmm. and having diverse skill sets. I think that's really quite important. And of course, like, you know, teams, there might be like different views on like doing certain things. But as long as like, if you can reach a middle ground and then like you have a similar goal that you're trying to, you know, reach towards, I think that's the, one of the most important things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so complementary skill sets. Well, complementary skill sets and so having the same. But then, but then you're a team, right? So you are yeah, going to be a CEO. So what do you think people believe in you, trust in you to be the leader? Um, I guess like it will come with like you over have, time. You have like, charisma. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, CEOs definitely need uh, charisma, <laughs> and uh, I mean, you basically need trust from your team to like you know that you can do this particular yeah, role. Like, yeah. for example, if I trust my CTO or like uh, software, like they can do it. They can do this job. The way I trust them, they need to trust me in the same way. So I think they, maybe like it mainly comes down to trust, like whether mm -hmm. you know, they, they have to trust in you, like whether you can perform uh, to the expectations. I think that's quite important. Okay, so what are the biggest challenges that you're facing now? Oof. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, we are in a pretty early stage. Um, we have this technology, we have patented it. And we have identified a potential market that uh, that we will bring value in. Um, the biggest challenge right now for our team is actually to um, sort of like prove that this concept, the whole thing will work. So this, basically, it's like yeah. doing the POC. Uh, mm. so, so you see, this is a first fire. I can detect it in 30 minutes and that's the value that I can give to you. Yes. And you need to prove it. Yes. So right now we have this grand idea, but we need to go out there and then do the proof of concept. And, and with the proof of concept, then we will have like a lot more stronger like uh, push. And mm -hmm. when we actually pitch to the investors and pitch to potential clients, then yeah, we can detect the fire with like 95% confidence level then. Uh, within how much distance from the smoke. Uh, all these like technical details when it comes up. And uh, I think that's that's the challenge that we're trying to tackle. Like, we're taking all these things like one by one, like step by step. So uh, in the next few months, what we're going to try is all these things integrated together into one single device. And uh, after, you know, like functional testing of all these like separate systems, like lower solar power systems. Yeah. Um, flight accuracy, like how, how, how accurately it can land, how will it secure on the treetop? Mm -hmm. uh, and all these things, when we actually uh, piece by piece put it together, then we try it out. Um, potentially, like maybe in uh, Australia, um, we have like some uh, potential contact there. And if we can try it out, and I think then we'll have a much stronger um, uh, 
sort of like voice mm. you know, when we mm -hmm. when we actually pitch. Yeah. yeah, it's a hypothesis, but you prove it. Yes. So once you prove it, then people will say, okay, I'm confident, and they will invest, right? Yeah. So that you can further expand. Okay. I think that's great. So I think we uh, we come to the end of the, the sessions. And thank you, Shane, for joining us. You are the first speaker of the year for 2022. And I'm really excited about the concept of digital forest. I think there is really something that uh, not just to about talking about uh, the important task of uh, uh, preventing forest fire, which is a big issue, but you really need to add on because we're digital, right? Digital forest, right? We digitize the forest. There, there are a lot more things that we can do. Detect animal life, right? Detect poachers, right? Uh, maybe even monitoring the, the health of the forest. There are tons of things that we can do. And if you are really interested, then you may want to approach Shane, right? Intern for him. <laughs> so we're almost welcome and I'd like to thank Shane for coming to talk to us tonight and uh, very good wishes for you for 2022. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Do you want to have a last uh, statement for the audience? Right. Um, if you're passionate about saving the environment, using technology to solve like all these uh, pressing issues like wildfires, yeah, uh, feel free to join us and we can work together to create a better world. Well said, yeah. a better world for tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank See you. you next week. Yeah.